Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about the serial killer Richard Ramirez, who's just a big old dink. Murking people left and right, stealing all their shit. Not cool. So let's get into the story, shall we? Richard Ramirez was born in El Paso, Texas on February 29th, 1960, the youngest of Julian and Mercedes Ramirez's five children. His father, Julian, a Mexican national and former Sedad Jerez policeman, who later became a laborer on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway, was prone to fits of anger and often resulted in physical abuse. As a 12-year-old, Richard, or Richie, as he was known by his family, was strongly influenced by his older cousin, Miguel, a decorated Green Beret combat veteran who often boasted of his gruesome exploits and abuses during the Vietnam War. He shared Polaroid photos of his victims, including Vietnamese women that he raped. <laughs> In some of the photos, Mike posed with the severed head of a woman he abused. Why? Richard, who had begun smoking marijuana at the age of 10, bonded with Mike over joints and gory war stories. Mike taught his young cousin some of his military skills, such as killing with stealth. Richard was present on May 4th, 1973, when his cousin Mike fatally shot his wife, Jessica, in the face with a 38 caliber revolver during a domestic argument. After the shooting, Richard became sullen and withdrawn from his family and peers. Later that year, Richard moved in with his older sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto, an obsessive peeping Tom, who took Richie along in his nocturnal exploits. God, he just can't get away from the terrible influences, can he? Ramirez also began using LSD and cultivated an interest in Satanism. Mike was found not guilty of Jesse's murder by reason of insanity and was released in 1977 after four years of incarceration at the Texas State Mental Hospital. His influence over Ramirez continued. The adolescent Ramirez began to meld his burgeoning sexual fantasies with violence, including forced bondage and rape. While in, still in school, he took a job at the local Holiday Inn where he used his passkey to rob sleeping patrons. His employment ended abruptly after he attempted to rape a woman in her hotel room before her husband came back. Although the husband beat Ramirez senseless, at the scene, criminal charges were dropped when the couple did not want to return for the trial. They're like, eh, we're, we're just not going to come back, dude. Ramirez dropped out of Jefferson High School in the ninth grade. At the age of 22, he moved to California where he settled permanently. This is when everything goes downhill. On April 10th, 1984, Ramirez murdered a nine-year-old Chinese-American... May Leong, in the basement of the hotel where he was living, in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. He raped and beat the girl before stabbing her to death and hanging her body from a pipe. This, Ramirez's first known killing, was not identified as being connected to the subsequent crime spree until 2009, when Ramirez's DNA was matched to a sample obtained at the crime scene. On June 28, 1984, 79-year-old Jenny Vincal was found brutally murdered in her apartment in Glasgow Park, Los Angeles. She had been stabbed repeatedly while asleep in her bed, and her throat slashed so deep she was nearly decapitated. Oh, wow, dude. Seriously. You just suck. <laughs> On March 17, 1985, Ramirez attacked 22-year-old Maria Horrendez outside her home in Rosemead, California, shooting her in the face with a 22 caliber handgun after she pulled into her garage. She survived when the bullet ricocheted off the keys she held in her hand as she lifted them to protect herself. Inside the home, her roommate, Dil Yoshi Okazaki, aged 34, heard the gunshot and ducked behind a counter when she saw Ramirez enter the kitchen. When she raised her head, he shot her once in the forehead, killing her instantly. Within the hour of the Rosemead home invasion, Ramirez pulled 30-year-old Sai Lian Veronica Yu out of her car in Monterey Park, shot her twice with a 22 caliber handgun, and fled. She was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. The two murders, an attempted third, in a single day attracted extensive coverage from news media, who dubbed the attacker, described as curly-haired with bulging eyes and wide-spaced rotting teeth, the walking killer, and the valley intruder. 
Dude, don't give killers names. I mean, yeah, does it sound cool? Yeah. But honestly, you're just egging them on because they're like, oh shit, people think I'm cool. And in reality, no one thinks you're cool. On March 27th, 1985, Ramirez entered a home and he that he burglarized a year earlier. So you're just going back for a second time, you dick. Just outside of Whitt Whittier, California, at approximately 2 a.m., he killed the sleeping Vincent Charles Zazara, age 64, with a gunshot to his head from a 22 caliber handgun. Zazara's wife, Maxine Lavinia Zazara, age 44, was awakened by the gunshot. Ramirez beat her and bound her hands while demanding to know where her valuables were. While he ransacked the home, Maxine escaped her bonds and retrieved a shotgun from under the bed, which, sadly, was not loaded. That freaking horror movie moment where you're like, Frick. The infuriated Ramirez shot her three times with the 22 caliber, then fetched a large carving knife from the kitchen. He mutilated her body by stabbing her several times, then gouged out her eyes and placed them in a jewelry box, which he took with him. Vincent and Maxine's bodies were discovered by their son, Peter. Ramirez left footprints from a pair of Avia sneakers in the flower beds, which police photographed and cast. This was virtually the only evidence that the police had at the time, Bullets found at the scene were matched to those at the previous attacks, and the police determined that a serial killer was at large. On May 14th, 1985, Ramirez returned to Monterey Park and entered the home of Bill Doy, age 66, and his disabled wife Lillian, age 56. Surprising Doy in his bedroom, Ramirez shot him in the face with a 22 semi-automatic pistol as Doy went for his own handgun. After beating the mortally wounded man unconscious, Ramirez entered Lillian's bedroom, bound her with thumb cuffs, then raped her after he ransacked the home for valuables. Bill died of his injuries while in the hospital, but luckily, Lillian survived. I don't know if luckily is the word I would use. I mean, yeah, she survived. That's awesome, but surviving and having to deal with that is also quite difficult. On the night of May 29th, 1985, Ramirez drove a stolen car to Monarova and stopped at the house of Mabel Ma Bell, age 83, and her disabled sister, Florence Nettie Lang, age 81. Finding a hammer in the kitchen, he bludgeoned and bound Lang in her bedroom, then bound and bludgeoned Bell before using an electrical cord to shock the woman. After raping Lang, he used Bell's lipstick to draw the satanic pentagram symbol on her thigh as well as on the walls of both bedrooms. The women were found two days later alive but comatose. Bell later died of her injuries. The next day, Ramirez drove the same car to Burbank, California and sneaked into the home of Carol Kyle, age 42. At gunpoint, he bound Kyle and her 11-year-old son with handcuffs, then ransacked the house. He released Kyle to direct him to where the family's valuables were. He then raped her repeatedly, like a duck. Ramirez also repeatedly ordered her not to look at him, telling her at one point that he would cut her eyes out. He fled the scene after retrieving the child from the closet and binding the two together with handcuffs. On the night of July 2nd, 1985, he drove a stolen car to Arcadia and randomly selected the house of Mary Louise Cannon, aged 75, a widowed grandmother. After quietly entering Canning's home, he found her asleep in her bedroom. He blundered her into unconsciousness with a lamp, then repeatedly stabbed her using a 10-inch butcher knife from her kitchen. On July 5th, 1985, Ramirez broke into a home in Sierra Madre and bludgeoned 16-year-old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron as she slept in her bedroom. After searching in vain for a knife in the kitchen, Ramirez attempted to strangle the girl with a telephone cord. He stated that he was startled to see electrical sparks emanate from the cord, and when his victim began to breathe, he fled the house, believing that Jesus Christ had intervened and saved her. Bennett survived the savage beating, although 478 stitches were put into her head. Jesus Christ. On July 7th, 1985, Ramirez burglarized the home of Joyce Lucille Nelson, age 61, in Monterey Park. Finding her asleep on her living room couch, he beat her to death by using his fists and kicking her in the head. A shoe print from an Avia sneaker was imprinted on her face. That's how hard he kicked her. Imprinted his shoe on her face. After cruising two other neighborhoods, he returned to Monterey Park and chose the home of Sophie Dickman, age 63. Ramirez handcuffed and assaulted Dickman at gunpoint, attempted to rape her, and stole her jewelry. When she swore to him that he had taken everything of value, he told her to swear on Satan. On July 20th, 1985, Ramirez purchased a machete before driving 
a stolen Toyota to Glendale, California. He chose the home of Le Layla Needing, age 66, and her husband, Maxon, age 68. He burst into the sleeping couple's bedroom and hacked them with the machete. Then killed them with shots to the head with his 22 caliber handgun. He further mutilated their bodies with the machete before robbing the house of valuables. After quickly fencing the stolen items from the needing residence, Ramirez drove to Sun Valley. At approximately 4.15 a.m., he broke into the home of the Konovev family. He shot the sleeping Sharon Konovev in the head with a 25 caliber, caliber handgun, killing him instantly. Then, repeatedly raped and beat some kid. He bound the couple's terrified eight-year-old son while dragging some kid around the house to reveal the location of any valuables, which he stole. During the assault, he demanded that she swear to Satan that she was not hiding any money from him. On August 6, 1985, Ramirez drove to Northridge and broke into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. He crept into the bedroom, startled Virginia, age 27, and shot her in the face with a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun. He then shot Chris in the neck and attempted to flee. Chris fought back while avoiding being hit by two more shots during the struggle before Ramirez managed to escape. The couple survived their injuries. On August 8, 1985, Ramirez drove a stolen car, love to do that, to Diamond Bar, California, and chose the home of Sakina Abawath, age 27, and her husband, Elias Abawath, age 31. Sometime after 2.30 a.m., he entered the house and went into the master bedroom. He instantly killed the sleeping Elias with a shot to the head. He handcuffed and beat Sakina while forcing her to reveal the locations of the family's jewelry, and then brutally raped her. He repeatedly demanded that she swear on Satan that she would not scream during his assaults. When the couple's three-year-old son entered the bedroom, Ramirez tied the child up and then continued to rape the, the wife. Because he's embarrassed. After Ramirez left the home, Sakina untied her son and sent him to the neighbor for help. On August 18th, 1985, he entered the home of Peter and Barbara Pan. He shot the sleeping Peter, age 66, in the temple with his 25 caliber handgun. He then beat and sexually assaulted Barbara, age 62, before shooting her in the head and leaving her for dead. At the crime scene, Ramirez used lipstick to scrawl a pentagram and the phrase Jack the Knife on the bedroom wall. When it was discovered that the ballistics and shoe print evidence from Los Angeles crime scenes matched the pan crime scene, San Francisco's then mayor, Diane Feinstein, divulged the information to the press. This leak infuriated the police because they knew that he would be watching, which Ramirez was. Ramirez, who was indeed watching the press, dropped his size 11 Avia sneakers over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge. He remained in the area for a few more days before heading back to the Los Angeles area. On August 24th, 1985, Ramirez traveled 76 miles south of Los Angeles in a stolen orange Toyota to Mission Vejo. That night, he arrived at the home of James Romero Jr., who had just returned from a family vacation to Rosito Beach in Mexico. Romero's 13-year-old son, James Romero III, happened to be awake and heard Romero's footsteps outside the house. Thinking there was a prowler, James went to wake his parents, and Romero fled the scene. James raced outside and noted the color, make, and style of the car, as well as the partial license plate number. Romero contacted the police with this information, believing James had chased away a thief. After this encounter, Ramirez broke into the home of Bill Carnes, age 30, and his fiance, Eins Erickson, age 29, through a back door. Ramirez entered the sleeping couple's bedroom and awakened Carnes when he cocked his gun. He shot Carnes three times in the head before turning his attention to Erickson. Ramirez told the terrified woman that he was the night stalker and forced her to swear she loved Satan, beat her with his fists, and bound her with neckties from the closet. Before leaving the home, Ramirez told Erickson, tell them the night stalker was here. Erickson untied herself and went to the neighbor's house to get help for her severely injured fiance. Sergeant removed two bullets from his head and he survived with his injuries. Erickson gave a detailed description of the assailant to investigators and police obtained a cast of Ramirez's footprint from the Romero house. The stolen car was found abandoned on August 28th in Wilshire Center, Los Angeles, and police obtained a single fingerprint from the rearview mirror, despite Ramirez trying to clean it all up. The print was positively identified as Ramirez's, who was described as a 25-year-old drifter from Texas with a long rap sheet that included many arrests for traffic and illegal drug violations. 
Law enforcement officials decided to release a mugshot of Ramirez from December 12, 1984 for an auto theft to the media, and the night sucker finally had a face. At the police press conference, he, it was announced, We know who you are now, and soon everyone else will. There will be no place you can hide. On August 30th, 1985, Ramirez took a bus to Tuscan, Arizona to visit his brother, unaware that he had become the lead story in virtually every single newspaper and television news uh, broadcast across California. After failing to meet his brother, he returned to Los Angeles early on the morning of August 31st. He walked past police officers who were staking out the bus terminal in hopes of catching the killer should he attempt to flee and into a convenience store in East Los Angeles. After noticing a group of elderly Mexican women fearfully identifying him as El Matador, the killer, <laughs> Ramirez saw his face on the front pages on the newspaper rack and fled the store in a panic. After running across the Santa Ana freeway, he attempted to carjack a woman but was chased away by bystanders who pursued him. After hopping over several fences and attempting two more carjackings, he was eventually subdued by a group of residents one of whom had struck him over the head with a metal bar in the pursuit. Deserve that bitch. The group held Ramirez down and relentlessly beat him until the police arrived. Jury selection for the trial began on July 22nd, 1988. At the first court appearance, Ramirez raised a hand with a pentagram drawn on it and yelled, Hail Satan. On August 3rd, 1988, the Los Angeles Times reported that some jail employees overheard Ramirez planning to shoot the prosecutor with a gun which Ramirez intended to sneak in. Consequently, a metal detector was installed outside, and extensive searches were conducted before people entering. On August 14th, the trial was interrupted because one of the jurors, Phyllis Singletari, did not arrive at the courtroom. Later that day, she was found shot to death in her apartment. The jury was terrified, wondering if Ramirez had planned her death from inside his cell, and whether or not he could reach the other jurors. However, it was ultimately determined that Ramirez was not responsible for her death as she was shot and killed by her boyfriend, who then committed suicide with the same weapon. The alternate juror who replaced her was too frightened to return home because she was just like, what if that's a lie and she could die, you know? I mean, I understand it. I mean, yeah, it could have been a boyfriend, but it doesn't mean that Ramirez couldn't have planned the whole thing. On September 20th, 1989, Ramirez was convicted of all charges, 13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. During the penalty phase of the trial on November 7th, 1989, he was sentenced to die in California's gas chamber. He stated to reporters after the death sentence, Big deal. Death always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland. The trial cost $1.8 million, which in today's money is $3.7 million. Psychiatrist Michael H. Stone describes Ramirez as a made psychopath, as opposed to a born psychopath. He says that Ramirez's schizophrenic personality disorder contributed to his indifference to the suffering of his victims and his untreatability. Stone also stated that Ramirez was knocked unconscious and almost died on multiple occasions before he was even six years old, and as a result later developed temporal lobe epilepsy, aggressivity, and hypersexuality. Ramirez died of complications secondary to B-cell lymphoma at the Marin General Hospital in Green Bay, California on June 7, 2013. He had been affected by chronic substance abuse and chronic hepatitis C viral infection as well. At age 53, he had been on death row for more than 23 years. By some estimates, he would have been in his early 70s before execution was carried out due to California's lengthy appeals process. To conclude, I hate this man. <laughs> this man sucks. He just, sometimes he would just randomly go in a house. You're like, no, I'm gonna do I'm gonna go into this old person's house, steal all their shit, rape the woman, kill the guy, maybe just kill them both. Usually kill them both. And it's like, he didn't have to do that. I knew he had a terrible childhood. I mean, his dad sucked. He was just surrounded by terrible influences. You know, Peeping Tom, a guy who described his murder exploits, an abusive father. You got all those figures in your life, plus mental conditions. Like, you're not going to be doing very well. All right? They had a big, big cause to the way he turned out. 
What also pisses me off is that he didn't even get... He got the death penalty, but didn't get killed by the death penalty. Seriously? He was on there for 23 years. And died from other complications. It's like, dude... Dude. If you're gonna put someone on death row... Yes, I understand that it can be a long process. If you're gonna put someone on death row... Kill them. Alright? The point of getting the death penalty is to actually kill them by gas chamber, legal injection, whatever, right? He was on there for 23 years, and I know some serial killers who've gotten the death penalty who are still on death row now. And it's like, we're paying taxpayer money to keep them alive when they are supposed to be dead. They've probably been on death row for 20 plus years. They should have been dead 20 plus years ago, all right? Just kill them. Kill them right away. Don't wait. It just costs more money. Just kill the bastard. I'm so pissed that he didn't get what was coming to him. What the fuck? This man deserved to be killed. And he just died of natural causes because it takes so long. Two bitches. So yeah, that's my rant. Um, I'm glad he got caught. He deserves to be punished. I'm just sad that he didn't get the penalty that he should have gotten. I hope you guys enjoyed this story as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright guys, I'll see you later. Whoosh.